Scared to Death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that has no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. I am a hopped up version of uh, Lindsay. Oh, Lindsay's got the coffee. <laughs> uh, thanks for the ratings and reviews lately, Creeps and Peepers. We've gotten a lot of new listeners, li- li- new listeners lately. Not anymore. They're going to leave. This, is like, got, oh, this guy man. can't talk. And we so appreciate you. Hope you stick around and share this with your friends. And a uh, couple of very brief announcements. And then so much horror. Uh, extra excited to tell my stories. Me too, I know me you too. love your stories too. We always like the stories, but some weeks you like them a little bit more. Get that, that, that's this like, is that week for both of us. It's like when you're watching a TV show and you're like, oh my God, last week's episode was the yes. best. Until two weeks later and then you say it all over again. <laughs> uh, Hitting the Bad Magic Store is the Severed Collection featuring gory prosthetics. Hyper-realistic, um, bloody severed human parts in magnet and keychain form. I'm trying to put this little ear next to my ear. Uh, we've got- <laughs> it's so we, gross. We've got the Got Your Nose fridge magnet, which is uh. exactly what it sounds like. Assorted keychain options, including the listen up, toe freaking way, stop pointing at me, fingers, ears, and toes, oh my. A special shout out to the beautiful custom work by visual effects artist and fan of the show, the badass Tony Campanga at Spellbound FX. You guys, it, they're like, the finger has like the fingernail, the cuticle bed. Oh, man. Like, it's they're so, so hyper realistic. Gross. There's even a, uh, on a couple of the samples that I got, it's like the stringy, it almost looks like a couple pieces of hair in there. Like, yeah. Oh, man, it's gross. This, one, this one's great for like little kids, like a bad dad joke, this keychain with the thumb. You like thumbs up ah, ah, and pretend that your thumb falls off. Our kids and there's little this, four year olds will free, lose their minds, but like seven year olds will laugh so hard. <laughs> um, so you can head on over to badmagicmerch.com and grab your severed unit today. Limited amount available. Uh, each unit's custom and unique. And then also just very quick before you share the charity information. Thanks to everyone who scooped up the sticker packs for the street team this year. We ran out of stock in minutes, so we are going to do a restock. Ordering 500 more, uh, watch socials or listen to future announcements. Probably next week's episode to learn when they will be available. Uh, thinking like, you know, end of August, beginning of September, give plenty of people a time still to do the uh, the contest to win the merch credit. Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, that's it. Okay, are you done? Are you I'm done, done. I'm done. done. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, finally, uh, we have this month's charity announcement. Sorry for the delay. There's just a lot of things going on around here. Um, I'm super stoked about this month's charity. All of them, again, same thing. They're really cool, but this one I just felt like was ex- exceptionally special. Sustainable Alamance is a nonprofit based in North Carolina, and the mission of Sustainable Alamance is to focus on and help individuals who were formerly incarcerated gain and sustain employment so that they may not only live within the community constructs, but also contribute to society as well. When I was on their website and I was reading about the steps that are required for formerly incarcerated people to even to begin to rebuild their lives, it, it was just such an eye opener. And I say this as someone who has a felon, a family member who's a felon, like, I don't know how I didn't understand how hard it's been, yeah. ha- was, and continues to be for him to rebuild his life. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just a really special place. And uh, they have this quote on their website, and I think that this encompasses it all. Poverty is not a lack of money, but a lack of resources. We believe that you can give a man a fish, charity, and even teach a man to fish, grace and mercy, but we must also ensure access to the lake, to the lake, hope and justice. I love that access to the lake. Like, yeah, that's, that's the that's most, so cool. yeah, it's such a beautiful quote. So, um, and if you'd like to learn more about Sustainable Alamance, you can visit sustainablealamance.org. Uh, $1,546 will go into the scholarship fund, leaving $13,915 to be donated to Sustainable Alamance in the month of August. And I, and I just love that it saves, uh, you know, taxpayers a lot of money. You know, yes. you can go on the website and see all these stats. And also, you know, like there's these people, you know, I won't go spend a bunch of time here. You've heard me say this a lot on Time Suck, but it's like, you know, somebody who was busted for selling weed. Yeah. And and, it, and now their life was taken away. Yeah, their entire life has been ruined. Now they can't yep. get, no, that, that was the thing that like shocked me mm-hmm. when I was reading these numbers. It's like, I didn't know this. 
But yeah. when you leave prison, yeah. you need to prove that you have somewhere to live. Mm-hmm. Like that you that you're not just going to be homeless. Or I'm sure the mentality is like that you're not gonna continue to be a strain on society. Sure, sure. Like I'm sure it's this like gross thing. And it's like, okay, but do you know how impossible it is to get an apartment as a convicted felon? Yeah. It's seven to ten years is like it. Uh, they want you to have been out for seven to 10 years before they feel like they can trust you again. Yeah. And what if you don't have family? Like that's where like that poverty piece comes in where it's like, mm-hmm. we keep putting, I mean, there are people that deserve to be in prison. Make no mistake of that. But these other, yeah. there are a lot of non- nonviolent offenders right. also in there. And then, and they're already living in poverty. They were yep. already, they were probably arrested for doing something that they were doing to make money because they live in this shitty situation. Totally. And it's just this bad, yeah, bad cycle. cycle. And, yeah. we can, and we can go on and on, but please just check out their website. Yeah, enough, uh, enough of us. And thank you for letting us do that. Yeah, thank you for trusting us to make awesome donations mm-hmm. on your behalf. So how many stories do you have? This week? We have two, right? I have two. I have two. My first story is called It Spoke to Me, a tale of a thrift store purchase gone awry. And my second tale is The Women of the Valley, a tale of an abandoned brothel. Okay. Okay. I like I like I like the way these stories are. Okay. Uh, I have two as well. Two There's great- no sex in the second story. Just don't get excited. <laughs> two great ones. Um, I don't know which one I like more. Uh, for the first, a young woman around a century ago in a mining town that is now a ghost town in New Mexico reaches out to the other side to try and communicate with her dead father and dead brother, and she contacts something. Very fun mix of history, lore, and her encounter. What is so funny? <laughs> Anybody who has an Apple Watch, I don't know if this has ever happened to you. If you hit the little like dial button, it could sometimes just kind of like start recording stuff. We just sent the most insane text message to one of my friends, okay. <laughs> just like us talking. <laughs> For my second story, a latchkey kid encounters a special kind of terror that makes spending time alone at home far harder than it already was for a young child. And if I give anything else uh, away, I will ruin it. Uh, you ready to get socked and started? Let's do it. Let's do it. Look at these special socks I got when we were on our family trip to Norway. They're just super cute. And, <laughs> and I even have a special blanket this week. Yeah. Check out this guy. Yeah, so cool. This Thanks is so cool. to the fan who, who sent this in. This is incredible. Yeah. Um, you guys, when the mail comes in, we get it once a week, and it uh, things get a little crazy around here. So I would love an email from the person who sent this in because I want to talk to you. Look yeah. at how cool this is. It's all old Scared to Death t-shirts. Scared to Death t-shirts. You can also see this on our social media at Scared to Death Podcast on it, Insta. It is badass. Okay, quite a bit of historical setup. I think very interesting historical setup for this first tale. I was talking to Logan about it before the show. Uh, Dawson is a ghost town in Colfax County, New Mexico. Dawson was once part of the Maxwell Land Grant, a rancher named Lucian Bonaparte Maxwell. What a name. Uh, owned 1.7 million acres. Holy shit. Yep, land uh, that covered much of northeastern New Mexico. Lucian, one of the biggest landowners in the history of the United States. Hard for me to process a single person owning that much land. He owned more land than the entire state of Delaware. In 1869, a man named John Barkley Dawson, a Texas ranger and cattle rancher, came to the area searching for a homestead, purchased over 24,000 acres of land from Maxwell for $3,700. Dawson then found coal on his land, decided to use it as a fuel source instead of wood. Some of his neighbors soon asked to try it out, quickly developed a thriving coal business. Wow. In 1901, Dawson sold most of his land to himself, the Dawson Fuel Company. Oh, uh uh-huh. Genius. Yep. His company bought it for $400,000. Dawson Fuel was founded with the help of Charles B. Eddy, a railroad promoter from Texas, and the Dawson Coal Mines opened in 1901. And a 137-mile-long railroad was built from the mine in Dawson all the way to the brand-new town of Tucumcari, New Mexico, then known as Douglas, which was a new junction for a transcontinental rail service that could take Dawson's coal coal all around the nation. By August 1st, 1901, a crew of 50 miners had arrived in Dawson to harvest coal to be transported. By the end of the first year of operations, Dawson was the largest coal mining operation in all of New Mexico. By 1905, there were 2,000 residents for the company town. Dawson Fuel built 100 cottages for the workers. The shiny new burg also had a post office, a liquor store, mercantile, school, newspaper, and a hotel. 1906, the Phelps Dodge Corporation purchased the mines. Due to a need to attract more workers, the company built more homes for the miners and their families, a four-story department store, a hospital, theater, swimming pool, bowling alley, baseball park, pool hall, golf course, lodge hall, 
even an opera house. Can you imagine how exciting that must have been if you lived there? Oh yeah, all really quick like, too. what? This is the best thing ever. It would feel yep. like Disneyland. This town is just exploding with all this culture and stuff now. Dawson's thriving. There were also two large churches, three schools, and an electric plant. And then it grew further. Over the years, many immigrants from Italy, China, Poland, Germany, Greece, England, Finland, Sweden, Mexico, and elsewhere came to Dawson to work in the mines. And Dawson's population grew to around 9,000 people. And for the first few decades, the mines that built the town also never harmed its residents to any atypical degree. On October 20th, 1913, the New Mexico Inspector of Mines inspected the Dawson coal mines and declared that they, there were 10, were free from traces of gas and in splendid general condition. But then just two days later, uh -oh. October 22nd, a massive tragedy struck. A tragedy that still to this day is the second worst mining disaster in U.S. history. 284 miners were working and 263 of them killed in an explosion in mine number two. Oh my God. Two more people then died during the rescue. The explosion was powerful enough to send fire 100 feet out of the tunnel mouth and shake homes two miles away. Holy shit. The Albuquerque Journal report reported two days later, 247 men, a great portion of whom are known to be dead, are the object of the search from which strong miners all day have been returning practically empty-handed, weary, and with blanched faces. Bodies of 38 miners killed as they stood at the instant of the explosion were the total of the day's work of recovery. And of this number, many were so mutilated that identification was uh, impossible and probably will continue so until all of the bodies have been brought to the surface and their checks compared. Ugh. It took several weeks to bury all the victims, and the Dawson Cemetery had to be expanded to accommodate so many new graves. Investigators determined an overcharged blast in a dusty section of the mine had caused the explosion. Dynamite was being used, which legally was not permitted when miners were still in certain portions of the tunnels. The Bureau of Mines regulations stated that all miners had to be evacuated before using explosives, and water sprays had to be used to settle the coal dust, but those rules not followed. Then a decade later, Another catastrophic explosion occurred in the Dawson Mines. Oh my God. February 8th, 1923, mine number one now experienced an explosion. When a mine car derailed, hit support timbers in the tunnel mouth, and ignited coal dust. 120 went, 121 men died. There were only two survivors who walked out of the mine the next day. Dawson had now suffered more mining-related deaths than any community, community in American history, and it still holds that tragic distinction today. Despite two massive tragedies in just a decade's time, the Dawson Mines can remain operational for just over 25 additional years. And the once thriving community then quickly fell into literal ruins when that ended. In 1950, the Phelps Dodge Corporation sold not just the mine, but the entire now dilapidated town to a salvage company in Phoenix. Most of the buildings were destroyed, some were relocated, and Dawson was now a true ghost town with only its large and largely filled cemetery remaining in addition to a few remaining structures, like the smokestacks from the coking ovens. And then those were demolished in the early 2000s because they were a liability. Dawson now today is part of a cattle ranch. You can still visit the cemetery, the only thing that remains, listed on the National His uh, Register of Historic Places. The cemetery is full of iron crosses that mark the graves of hundreds of dead miners. And I'll have pictures at the end. And some paranormal enthusiasts wonder, do some of their spirits still linger in Dawson? Every year, there are new reports of strange activity centering around the cemetery, especially at night. Some say they've seen unexplained lights bobbing up and down, lights that look exactly like a miner walking to the cemetery with their headlamp on. There are also reports of disembodied whispers and moaning. There are even reports of shadowy apparitions that thankfully typically disappear once approached and of cold spots felt at certain points in the cemetery. According to the paranormal blog, Seeks Ghosts, stories of paranormal activity began to spread through the town way back in 1913, in the days following the first catastrophic, catastrophic explosion. Claims of crying and moaning heard in the cemetery were reported. Some even said they saw human figures wandering about, lost in the darkness. The following story is, uh, was allegedly passed down from a former Dawson resident who lost two family members in the 1923 original mine explosion. Time now for the tale of the cemetery seance. The Bailey family was gutted by the second big explosion. Between the two tragedies, it seemed like almost every family in Dawson had lost someone. The Baileys had lost two someones, their family patriarch, Edward, and Edward's oldest son, Theo. 
Thea was just 18 and had only been working in the mines for less than a year. Edward didn't want any of his sons to follow in his footsteps, but Theo wanted to stay close to home. And outside of mining, the area didn't have much in the way of good jobs to choose from. Those left behind were Edward's wife, Mary, his middle son, James, and his daughter, Anna. Mary and James both had to work long hours to support the family. They couldn't afford to move back to the East Coast where Mary's family lived. So they were left on their own to fend for themselves and deal with the devastating loss. The entire community mourned after the second tragedy, but not for long. There was still work to be done. Always in Dawson, there was more work. Quickly, the surviving miners went back underground and tried to ignore the lingering fear that their lives could also end at a moment's notice, just like the hundreds who had died before them. Trains full of eager young men and their families soon filled the dead men's shoes. After a few years, the only physical remnants of the tragedy were the many crosses that filled the cemetery. Anna Bailey, now a teenager, had always been fascinated by the afterlife. And she often pondered what happened to her father and older brother Theo after the explosion. Where exactly did their souls go? Her mother discouraged her from worrying over such questions and told her to read her Bible if she wanted comfort. Anna had already read her entire Bible twice. She knew what it said regarding death and the afterlife, but her curiosity wasn't satisfied. What about the ghosts that some people claim to see? Were they really all fallen angels, nothing more than demons, like scripture said? She wanted to believe her father and brother might still be near. And some stories that floated around town after the accident fueled her belief in that very possibility. One evening, Anna was brought to one of the sources of some of those stories. She was bringing a completed order of homemade scented soaps, her mother's second job, to Mrs. Dunbar, an older woman whose husband passed away a year earlier. Anna didn't usually like going to her house, but Mrs. Dunbar was one of her mother's best customers. She didn't like going to her house because her home had a direct view of the cemetery from her back window. Anna knew exactly where her father and brother were buried, their graves marked by twin iron crosses, and the sight of those crosses always filled her heart with grief. As soon as Anna entered the small home, she found her eyes drawn to the cemetery, to her family's graves, and they stayed there. She could not even seem to look away despite the pain it brought her. As Anna stood transfixed, Mrs. Dunbar put a hand on her shoulder. Do you have any memories of the explosion? She asked. Anna thought it was an odd question to ask with no introduction, but supposed Mrs. Dunbar only brought it up because she was staring so intently at the cemetery. Anna nodded. Yes, I was only eight, but I remember the day very well. Mrs. Dunbar nodded and after a solemn pause said, a lot of men died. Anna now nodded herself, feeling a sad lump forming in her throat, and she felt tears start to form in her eyes. Mrs. Dunbar turned to look out at the cemetery before saying, There are ways to speak to the dead, you know. How? Anna quickly asked. Mrs. Dunbar continued speaking without answering her question. I talk to my William quite often. We're supposed to believe that the soul moves on once someone dies, but I don't think that's always true. Sometimes, the soul stays behind. What do you mean? Anna asked with a sudden note of hope in her voice. Well, it's different in every case. William died in this house, and now sometimes I hear his footsteps at night. Other times I simply feel his presence with me. He shows himself in different ways. I've also seen things out there, in the cemetery. I once saw a floating light amongst the crosses. It happened in the middle of the night, when I knew everyone in town was asleep in all likelihood, and I believe it was one of the miners. Some of them haven't left us yet. Anna was fascinated. Mrs. Dunbar had the information she'd been seeking. Without waiting for an invitation, Anna sat down. She planned to stay until all her questions had been answered. How do you speak to the dead, Mrs. Dunbar? Mrs. Dunbar sat next to her. There are many methods, I suppose, but I think the best thing to do is go to a spot where you think they might still linger. If you feel something, it's possible that they're present and willing to communicate with you. Spirits don't always speak verbally, though. Sometimes their attempts manifest as various sounds. Other times they can manipulate objects, like a candle or one of their favorite keepsakes. And there are tools one can use to talk to spirits more directly, like a Ouija board. Anna didn't have the money to buy one of those, and she didn't think she could hide it from her mother if she did. Are there any other ways? she asked. Mrs. Dunbar explained that since she lived so close to the cemetery, she had hosted something called a seance with a few of the town's many other widows. They lit some candles, sat around her table, opening themselves up and inviting communication from the spirit world. And it worked. 
They believed they'd contacted one of the other woman's dead husbands. Anna's spirit soared. She pictured all this in her mind's eye. She pictured herself sitting with them all as her father and brother's spirits appeared before them, assuring her that they were all right, that they were watching over her, and that she would someday join them in heaven with the Lord when she too passed. A longing smile painted itself across her face. Anna asked Mrs. Dunbar more questions about her seance, how exactly she had conducted it. Mrs. Dunbar told her all she knew, but that also she wouldn't be doing one with her. She didn't want to risk the town turning its back on her. She already said too much. There were rumors circling, rumors that could leave her more alone than she was already. Anna thought about what to do with her new secret knowledge. Mrs. Dunbar warned her that she mustn't tell anyone. The church and most of the people in town strongly disapproved of any attempts to contact the dead, feeling it was the devil's work. They could both end up shunned. Anna spent the next few nights tossing and turning, unable to sleep with all the thoughts running through her head. She couldn't stop feverishly wondering if her father or brother was still there, or if they'd gone on to the other side, as Mrs. Dunbar had called it. She had never heard anything strange in their home or felt a presence near her, but her father and brother had died in the mines. They died so suddenly, so full of life and plans for the future. That had to make them good candidates to still be around, didn't it? So where were they? Were they still deep inside the mines? Anna knew it wasn't possible to sneak into the mines without getting caught. She also had no desire to go there after what had happened, no matter how badly she wanted answers. It was too dangerous. She didn't know how her remaining brother could stand to work there after what had happened. She decided that the next best option would be to visit the cemetery. Were there spirits near their bodies? Mrs. Dunbar had said that was common. She hadn't been there for months since the last time they'd said the prayers that were held on the anniversary of their deaths. Anna now planned to go in three nights. It would take that long to work up enough courage, and it would be Monday, a night she felt would have the best chance of no one else being out late in their little mining town. Everyone would be tired from the beginning of the work week and preparing for the next work day. Her brother James was exhausted after work each day and went to bed about an hour after supper. He was a deep sleeper. Her mother, on the other hand, was a light sleeper and woke up at the slightest creak of the floorboards. Anna would have to carry her shoes in her hand and put them on outside. She'd take a pack of matches and a candle with her on the way out. There was also the back door to consider, which groaned loudly whenever it was opened. She'd have to oil the hinges ahead of time so she wouldn't arouse suspicion. Anna wasn't sure if a seance would work with just one person, but she felt like she had to try. Three nights later, Anna lay in her bed listening to her mother in the next room. She waited until all was quiet and then waited an extra 30 minutes to ensure her mother was asleep. She couldn't hear her brother in his room, and that made her a bit anxious, but he only snored when he was especially exhausted. Now was the time to act on her plan. Slowly and quietly, Anna got out of bed, praying the floorboards wouldn't creak. Luck was on her side as she put on her coat, gathered her candle and matches, and picked up her boots. She closed her bedroom door softly, hearing nothing more than the tiniest click. She held her breath as she tiptoed to the back door by the kitchen, and she breathed a sigh of relief when the door opened and closed silently. Anna! She slapped a hand over her mouth so she wouldn't shout and wake her mother. Her brother was behind her, leaning against the house, smoking a cigarette. Instead of answering him, she put her hand over her now rapidly beating heart. What are you doing out here? I, I was just getting some fresh, she started. Don't lie, I know you're up to no good. I, I'm going to Alice's house, he sighed. If you don't tell me the truth, I'm going to tell mother first thing in the morning that you snuck out. She glowered at him, although he probably couldn't see her expression clearly. For some reason, James could always tell, though, when she was lying. It drove her crazy. I'm going to the cemetery to see Father and Theo's graves. Not much to see in the middle of the night. I want to visit with them. She could tell he wanted to laugh. James always had a dark sense of humor. They're dead, Anna. What can they say to you? Actually, sometimes the dead are still with us, smart Alec. Mrs. Dunbar told me, Mrs. Dunbar? That old... He stopped himself. That woman is not in her right mind, Anna. She stepped closer to him. I don't care what you say. I'm going. And if you tell mother, I'll tell her I saw you take father's silver cufflinks. What were you doing with those? Gambling again? He huffed and threw his cigarette to the ground, stomping out the orange embers, frustrated she had him dead to rights. I'm coming with you. She knew this would be the only compromise to keep him from tattling. They both knew where to go, and they started walking. Thankfully, the sky was clear and the rocky path was illuminated by the moonlight. After only ten minutes of walking in silence, she and her brother arrived at their family's gravesite. Anna took out her candle and matches. What's this grand plan of yours? They couldn't wait for daylight, James asked. 
It's called a seance. We're going to light this candle. It attracts spirits with its light and warmth. James joked, I think you have spirits confused with moths. The look Anna shot him told him to quit teasing. He could tell she was about to tear up, and he knew, of course, why. He missed them too. I'll quit. She continued, The candles will help Theo and Father have a way to communicate with us. If they're here, they might give us a sign. Perhaps a flicker. Perhaps a sudden gust of wind that blows out the candles. At least that's what Mrs. Dunbar told me. James couldn't help rolling his eyes. Anna was unfazed. We're here, aren't we? She asked. We might as well try. Anna now sat on the ground, carefully placing the candle in the candlestick holder and lighting the match. The small flame shone on her father and brother's names. James sat down in front of her. Thankfully, it wasn't a windy night, but Anna still felt a chill in the air. The candle gently flickered, casting shadows around them. Anna held out her hands to James, palms up. He reluctantly joined his hands with hers. Anna paused before speaking, trying to sense something. She wasn't sure if she was doing it all right. She couldn't tell the difference between her own nervous energy, fear of being caught, and a true spirit's presence. She decided to start with something simple. Is anyone here with us? Anna asked to the open air. A few minutes of silence passed, moments of silence, before she asked another question. Are there any spirits here who want to communicate with us? We don't mean you any harm. Still nothing. Feeling a little silly, and also somewhat desperate, she asked, Father? Theo? Are either of you here with us? She couldn't hear or see anything, but Anna swore she felt the chill in the air grow a little colder, the breeze grow a little stronger. Will you give us a sign if you're here? She and her brother sat in silence for maybe a full minute now. Anna, James said gently, it was worth a try, I suppose, but it clearly doesn't work. Let's just go home. Anna sighed, feeling foolish and sad and angry, feeling so many things. She really thought Mrs. Dunbar was telling the truth. Maybe she was, and her father and Theo had already crossed over to the other side. She could only hope they ended up in heaven. Anna's shoulders slumped, prepared to blow the candle out, but she moved back when the flame suddenly surged up and began flickering rapidly. James, look, the candle! His eyes widened in disbelief. Do you think? She nodded. Ask another question. She thought of what she could ask that might get such a a response again. Father, Theo, if that was you, we're so glad you're here. We want to speak with you. Will you give us another sign if it really was one of you? Anna felt a chill race down her spine, and she watched as the flame swayed back and forth aggressively, despite the clear lack of wind. She and James grinned at each other. Say something to them, James, she encouraged. He hesitated before speaking. Father, Theo, I miss both of you. I wish we could see you again and have a real conversation. The candle flame jumped abnormally high before settling back down. Now you say something to them, James told her excitedly. We miss you so much, and I know Mother does too. I hope that you two are are together wherever you are and that you're at peace. She met James' eyes, which were glistening with unshed tears. Anna couldn't believe this was working. She had doubted it, despite her hope. But now in this moment, she knew in her heart it was real. She could feel their presence, like someone was looking over them from above. She wondered if it was her father, Theo, both. Anna's joy was then interrupted when James' grip on her hand tightened, painfully. His body leaned away from her, as well his head falling back at a sharp angle. Just as quickly he jerked forward, squeezing her hands tighter. James stared into her eyes, looking panicked, and he said in a low, groaning voice, Help me! What? Anna asked, confused and scared. Help me! He said again, louder. James, what's... Help me! He shouted. His voice was filled with pain as he screamed, Help! It burns! James, stop it! You're scaring me! Anna shouted back. Father! Father, where are you? Anna watched in horror as James' body shook. His grip on her hands was still so strong she couldn't pull away. He stopped talking and let out a scream of agony. She knew what was happening. Mrs. Dunbar had told her about it. A strong spirit can sometimes enter a person's body and use them to communicate. Anna had heard enough. Whatever was inside her brother James, Theo's spirit perhaps, it was causing him great physical pain. The only thing she could think to do to stop it all was to blow out the candle. And when she did, James stopped shaking. His grip on her hands loosened. Anna jerked her hands away, wincing from the, wincing from the residual pain. James gave her a bewildered look. What just happened? He whispered. I'm not sure, Anna answered. You don't remember? No, it felt like I lost consciousness or or, or fell asleep and woke up a minute later. I, I don't know what happened. You were screaming. You called for father. It was as if 
as if you were Theo for a moment. The tears that James had been holding in before fell down his cheeks. Perhaps this wasn't such a good idea after all. It might have brought a brief sense of peace to know her family's spirits were still there, but maybe the seance had disturbed them, brought up their last painful moments. Could they be living in that torment perpetually? Anna felt a deep sadness wash over her. Is that what had happened? Anna offered her hand to her brother, helped him up, and they walked home again in silence without speaking. They never talked about what happened after that night. James never told her their James never told their mother that they had left the house. Neither did Anna. It would only be upsetting. Anna never tried to communicate with her father or brother again. Eventually, she moved out of Dawson like everyone else and never returned, not even to visit the graves. She hoped that their spirits found a way to cross over to the other side and were no longer lingering in some hellish, fiery torment. Anna was never the same after that night. A deep sense of melancholy never left her. I mean, damn. Yikes. Let let lying dogs lie sort of thing, right? I mean, I understand Ooh. the desire. Yeah. The, 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 what feels like a need, but, yeah. you know, to find that closure and, you know, understand what happened. But maybe yeah. sometimes you don't want to understand. Yeah, what if the spirit's stuck in some loop or some residual part of the spirit yeah. stuck in that loop of exploding, like fire all around, like their tragic final moments of like death in that mine? My guess would be then in that instance, maybe there's a way to help them move on. Or, or I always wonder in those stories, like it's not like a, an actual, I don't know, soul or spirit. It's just like a, an echo like an echo something. of energy? Yeah, like not sentient, perhaps. Right. But, but just like a residual energy trapped in some horrible loop. It's sort of like that thing where when you walk into a room and you're like, whew, it feels not good in here. And then yeah. you find out some horrible thing happened right. there, just like a leftover. Leftover moment somehow. Mm -hmm. Like it just left such a strong uh, impression energy-wise on the area. It just yeah. changed the atmosphere somehow. It's kind of like how deja vu feels when you're mm -hmm. like, oh, this is so peculiar. I feel like I've been here. I know this, this feeling, this. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that's what it is, as opposed to the alternate, which like uh, the sentient soul or spirit of something truly trapped in like oh a God. horrific loop. That's literal hell. That's literal hell. Yeah. 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 I have some pictures. Okay. Uh, this first one, old pick of Dawson, New Mexico, when it was uh, a living town. Oh my gosh. It's out there in the desert. Cute little town. Here's another pick of the town. You know, no like great pics because of how long ago. Well, yeah. But still, it's like, it's so fascinating to me yeah yeah and then this next one old pick of uh bodies being pulled from the mines mm. following one of the explosions you don't see the body but just you know bringing them out with carts oh god uh and then a photo of part of the cemetery today just you know all the remains of the area you know overgrown with weeds and wildflowers yeah i mean i'm they're not putting new graves uh, no. you know so it's like who's no one's maintaining that and then another part of the cemetery just you know again just so many graves mm-hmm mm-hmm and what's crazy, what I was talking to Logan about before this is like, we were talking about if you had like a, a crazy time-lapse photography, like really sped up. Yeah. But I don't know that I've ever um, heard an equivalent of this town where it went from absolutely nothing mm -hmm. to a huge thriving community, like like a, a city by Old West standards. Absolutely. Opera house and all these things to literally nothing but a cemetery, like no remnants in less than a century. It's just like, like this weird, fast life cycle. Yeah, yeah. I wonder uh, what the, uh, what is it, the Phelps Dodge. Like, oh, the Dodge Phelps Corporation, yeah. Yeah, like, it's like before they moved out of there, I, w I wonder how much they did to just get rid of the town. A lot, it sounds like. It sounds like, uh, you know, salvaged mm -hmm. or, you know, like torn down. I'm sure some of it, a lot of it was taken to the dump, but it sounds like they salvaged oh, yeah. everything they could, like whatever precious metals were in the house, you know, yeah. wood that could be repurposed. What a strange. And move some structures. What a strange job. Yeah. To go disassemble. To liquidate it. Yeah. Yeah. To liquidate a town. A whole town. A whole town. Okay. Like start some burn piles for <laughs> yeah. the wood. Like, uh, I don't yeah. know, whatever you would find. Clothing, shoes. Yep. I, I don't know. Because this town is like Please. in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. I was going to say that actually sounds like if it's like a relatively small crew, like 10 of us to like do it over <laughs> the course of a few weeks. That sounds like an actual fun, like trip to it'd do. be interesting yeah are you insane <laughs> i think so to like dismantle no, I think so. the town and like get a hang out with your buddy i don't know very unique yeah unique for sure yeah i just think it's full of spoopiness and oh, yeah you're gonna have 
a week or two weeks or a month of just like you are not sleeping well and there's yeah. nowhere to go and there's nothing to do. So it's like, it's kind of like camping essentially. Like mm -hmm. you would have to come with all your supplies. I don't know if you know this and it's okay. It's a random question, but like yeah. how close is Dawson or what's left of Dawson to an actual town today? Not very close. I don't think, I, I don't have like the miles, but when I was looking at the map. Yeah. It is just like they found, you know, coal. I don't, I don't, I don't even know how, what method you use to detect like, like geologists and stuff mm -hmm. that could tell by the surface stones. Oh, there's I, there's coal here. Yeah, I think they you have know? this little like it's like bee doo bee doo bee doo <laughs> little meter. Uh -huh. like that. But um, but wherever they did, it's like that's the only the one and only reason there was a town there yeah. was just all this coal. But there's there's no like lake or river. There, right. And that's why like when it was done, it was just done. Yeah. But there's it's not a scenic area. It just like kind of like uh, northern Nevada in the, the high desert. You know, I don't do well there. Out in the middle of nowhere found something they could make money on and truly a company town well, yeah, where the actually, company built everything. You know, when we did that road trip and like we went to Virginia City and then we like stopped in that mm -hmm. random town. There yeah. was like a, a munitions museum. I know. I can't think of the name of it, but yes. Me either. I could find it if I went through our photos, but it's like, it was it's this eerie. tiny little town that just popped up quite literally out of nowhere. We were yeah. driving. And I was like, oh, okay. And we got like a pizza or something, mm -hmm. but everybody there just looked a little bit off. It like, like I don't a weird place to live. Yep, and I don't know like what the quality of the water or anything. I mean, everyone just looked a little sickly when I say off. I mean, <laughs> they just looked like they were a little bit sallow. They, I don't know, it, it was bizarro. I felt like I was in a freaking Rob Zombie movie. Yeah, it's like Twilight Zone. There was uh, Stephen King set one of his books. I, I want to say Desperation, and there was like two of them. He did like this one book. It was like maybe as Richard Bachman and Steve. but anyway, the setting was this uh, like remote Nevada town. And I remember the first time I drove through some of those areas, you know, like by my uncle Bobby, uh, Bobby Berman, uh, by, out in Grangeville by Ruth. I've never been to their house. Oh, have you ever met Bobby though? At like a family? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I was just say he lived and worked in one of, of those towns. He did. I know he's a very odd he guy. Fit, he fits the profile. Yes, he does. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, one of those just remote towns where there's like, you know, a couple restaurants, but everything is catered to the mines. And when the mines eventually close, the town just dies. Yeah, I don't even know how to put into words what it felt like. It does feel like Rob Zombie. To be there and just like, it's just so, ugh, I just bit my yeah. lip. It's just so sad. It, it, it truly really feels a little sad. dystopian. Yes, because, and it's like, obviously like no one chooses where they're born or whatever, but it's like, yeah. oh, you are stuck here. There's not even, it's not even like, oh, and in an hour, mm -hmm. there's a mall. Nope. Just more nothing. I know. I, yeah. I nearly lost my mind on that road. Trip. Some people, some people love that desert setting. You know, like the high, like sagebrush and everything. When it's, all, I don't think people love it. Oh no, I think some people do. Some people like the the dry air and they like that scenic. The, they like that look. Some artists but and I, stuff. Okay, artists. But I just don't think that anybody wants to live there in 2023, knowing what else is available in other places. To be literally in the middle of nowhere. Antisocial people do for your entire life. You know, it's like it's like how are you? How are you getting grocery? My stepdad could do that. Tim, it's like that. It's like that but personality. He, but he has certain creature comforts. He likes his. Mm -hmm. He likes his white boots. Like, do you know? He has certain things. It's like, dude, you're driving for days to get that shit. <laughs> Not days anymore. It's hours. And many, it, many, many uh, hours. Yeah, yeah. I don't it's think a different, that li different lifestyle. Not for you. Not for me. Not for me. I like a good facial. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> are you ready to leave a ghost town in New Mexico and head to a really creepy story? Yeah, Seem I am. Let's do it. This one's seemingly set in the 90s, but unknown location. This blanket is fantastic. Time now for the tale of let's have some fun. Oh, that doesn't sound good. The first time it happened, I was just nine years old. The classic latchkey kid. I wore a key around my neck on a necklace. Cute. We only lived about four blocks from school, and little me would walk home, let myself in, lock the door, and stay inside until dad got home a little after six. Mom passed away when I was five. Car accident. Dad never remarried. His friends, his parents, my mom's parents, everyone pushed him to date again. Partly for him and mostly for me. But he just wasn't interested. We were the two musketeers, he said, and we would manage just fine. And we did for the most part. And now today we are about as close as any kid and parent can be. I'm 36 and live just a few blocks away from him and not at his urging. It was my idea. The only real trouble dad and I ever dealt with was whatever was in our old house. The first time it happened, like I said, was when I was nine. I came home, locked myself in, turned on the TV. 
Tiny Toon Adventures was on. Mm -hmm. I never miss an episode. And I grabbed the after school snack dad always left in the fridge for me. Applesauce, cheese sticks, a box of grape juice, most likely. I sat down crisscross style in front of the TV and was totally engrossed in whatever was going on in the cartoon or in all the commercials that seemed to know exactly what toys I wanted. That's when I saw a flash of movement in the hallway. I turned my head just in time to barely see whoever it was disappear behind the partial wall. It looked like some kid about my size just ran by. I heard their footsteps and I heard them laughing. It scared the hell out of me. No one else was supposed to be home. No one else was home. I called out. Hey, what are you doing? I heard them laugh again from the kitchen. A moment later, I heard the fridge door open and shut. What are you doing? You're not supposed to be here. I called out again and slowly stood up. I remember balling up both my hands into fists. I didn't know how to fight. I was scared of fighting, but I thought I might have to do what I could. And then he ran right into the room with me. It scared me so bad I couldn't scream, let alone throw some kind of punch. He ran in carrying the same snack I'd just been eating, exactly the same, on the same plate. He sat down crisscross style just like I had in front of the TV and took a bite out of his cheese stick. He then turned and looked directly at me and laughed. Oh, fuck. I keep saying he, but I guess me would be more appropriate. I was looking at myself wearing the exact same outfit. He was identical in every way except just a bit different in his eyes. They might look the same to someone else, but I could tell there was something else behind them that wasn't normal. Something very old and terrible. I woke up about an hour later. I'd passed out. I wondered for a second if I dreamt it all, but if I did, why had I passed out from where I'd been standing? Why would I, why would I have gotten up from the floor and moved across the room a bit if the whole thing had been a dream? I never called my dad when he was at work, but I called him that day. I was sobbing, crying so hard I was hyperventilating. Dad couldn't even understand what I was saying. It freaked him out so bad he left work immediately. When I finally was able to tell him what had happened, he did his best to comfort me. But also, I knew he didn't believe me. I get it now. I wouldn't believe some little kid saying all that either. He reminded me that we both had to be strong. And that I was only to have him come home in case of a real emergency. He couldn't pull away. He could lose his job and we really needed that job. I understood as best as a nine-year-old could. If that thing showed back up, I was on my own. You can imagine how well that sat with me. I slept in my dad's bed that night, and he let me do that the next night and the night after that. Eventually, he started only letting me sleep at the foot of the bed on the floor, and then it was back to my room. By that time, it wasn't too bad because I hadn't seen that thing again. Hadn't seen myself again. That wouldn't happen for over two years. Not until I was 11. Dad started pack, uh, picking up some extra shifts at night. I was a responsible kid, and he trusted me enough by then to not get into anything I shouldn't be messing around with if he had to work. He also was good friends with some new neighbors we had, neighbors I could go to or call if anything went wrong. This time when it happened, I was watching Goosebumps. Watching it alone at night, so I was already a bit freaked out. A friend of mine at school watched it too, and we liked to talk about it. Sometimes he'd come over for sleepovers, and we'd watch it together, or I'd go to his house. But this time, unfortunately, I was all alone. Or, I guess I wasn't. I was sitting on the couch, eating microwave popcorn, staring at the TV. And that was when I heard my dad's recliner creak. When I looked over, I think I about became the only 11-year-old to ever die of a heart attack. That thing, that thing that looked exactly like me, was sitting in my dad's chair wearing what I was wearing, eating the same kind of popcorn out of the same kind of bowl, and I started screaming. The other me started laughing. I jumped off the couch, ran into my room, shut the door, and really wished I had a lock for it. Instead, I just held it shut with my hands. And then my stomach lurched when I heard myself out in the hall a few moments later. Come on, watch the show with me! <gasps> other me said it like we were the best of friends. I was crying. I was so damn scared. I'd never been that scared. I yelled, go away! Leave me alone! Other me laughed. Come on, let's have some fun. And then he tried to open the door. We struggled the door starting to open as he twisted and pulled. And then me shutting it again back and forth for what seemed like forever. Other me laughing while I shrieked in terror. Finally, inexplicably, the other me let go and all was quiet. I just stood there still holding the door for I don't know how long. It must have taken 10 or 15 minutes for me to fully stop crying and get my breathing back under control. I didn't know what to do. Dad wouldn't be home for a couple more hours. 
Right when I was about to crack the door open and peek outside, I heard a voice from right behind me. What are you afraid of? I just want to play. (gasps) My head snapped around and he was right behind me, standing in my room. My dad woke me up hours later when he got home. I'd passed out again. And I was hysterical when he shook me awake. When I could talk again, I told him everything. And just like the last time, he did his best to console me. But once again, he didn't believe me. He was convinced the horror movie I was watching had gotten me all kinds of worked up. So it was no more scary shows for a while. None at all. Goosebumps was out. He let me sleep in his room that night, but that was it. I was too old for that now, he said. I lived in fear for weeks, if not months after that. So many nightmares. But luckily I didn't see him again. Not for about a year. The next time it happened, I had just turned 13. A new kid had moved into the neighborhood, Richie. Richie. And he'd come over all the time. But not this day. This day, once again, I was alone. It's like it knew when not to show up. I didn't have to stay inside the house until dad got home anymore. And I was about to grab my backpack and ride down to Richie's so we could play some basketball. We always used my ball and I went in my room and grabbed it, put it in my backpack. When I walked back out to head down the hall and head out of the house, he was there. I was there. Standing inside the front door, wearing all the same stuff right down to the backpack I just put on. Let's go play some ball, other me said. Richie's waiting. Suddenly, it felt like the world was moving in slow motion. I spun around and ran back into my room. I slammed the door shut, the door that still didn't have a lock, and I heard him run down the hall towards it. Why are you hiding from me? It sounded so angry. And then other me twisted the knob as it slammed into the door. I barely hung on. I barely was able to shut the door again before it slammed into it a second time. I was sure the door was going to come off its hinges. What was it going to do to me? And then I heard my dad's voice. Ryan, what the hell are you doing? No! No, no, no. Then after hearing it roar like that, there was silence for a moment. And then my dad's voice. Ryan? Dad! I called out from inside my room. Is it gone? Holy fucking shit. That was the first time I'd heard my dad string those words together. Dad, is it still there? And then my doorknob twisted and I braced for the worst. My dad wasn't supposed to be home. Were there two of them out there? Another me and another dad? Was this the end? The door swung open and my dad stood there. My real dad, white as a ghost. We both just stared at one another for a second. I'm so sorry, he said. I'm so sorry, I never believed you. I ran into his arms and he gave me the biggest hug ever. We talked about everything that had happened that night and he put together a plan. He called Richie's parents, told them someone had broken into our place. And he asked if I could start going over to their house after school for a while. That was the official public story, a break-in. He knew no one else would believe the truth. Work had been going well, and now he immediately put the house up for sale, looked for another place in the same school district. After two months, two months where I literally never stayed at home alone again, and where I slept in a sleeping bag in my dad's room every night, we had a new place. And that thing never showed up. Where is it? I wonder if it's still in that house. I won't go near it and risk finding out. What is it? What did it want? I've heard plenty of other stories of doppelgangers now, and no one ever seems to know what they are and why they show up. That was terrifying. That is terrifying. (laughs) I'm so glad his dad saw it, though, just for like some sort of confirmation. Totally. I don't understand how doppelgangers can grow with you. And what I mean is like- Oh the yeah, first change time, their look as you- yeah, yeah, and then they have exactly what you have. The backpack, the basketball, the the after school snacks. Like These creepy mimics. I don't understand. Mimics might be the most confusing- Yeah. Uh, like paranormal thing because creatures, you know, <sighs> like skinwalkers, those are so abstract. They don't mm-hmm. look like us. They don't behave like us. I don't- uh, That thing, that- Ugh. 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 <laughs> I told you, super creepy story. So creepy. No pics associated with it, uh, but here's a pic of the creepy doppelganger family from Jordan Peele's Us. Oh, yeah. Peele explained that the fear of the doppelganger is a a primal human fear, and I agree. The fear of like being replaced. Uh, The masked one sitting on the floor. Uh Uh-huh. Oof. God, he's so good. He's so talented. I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. You can make that go away now. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I literally. And what a weird stretch of time in between each visit. Yeah, like is it recharging or something? Like it or needs. Is it terrorizing to ex- somebody else? Oh, is this going yeah. on in the whole neighborhood, but nobody's talking about it for fear of sounding like a lunatic? Hmm. I mean. 
that's an interesting thought. Like, does this thing bounce in and out? I mean, could be all over the place. Like, what if there are just like a couple doppelgangers? There's, but, a, there's just two in the whole wide world. <laughs> right, right. But they They're just bounce. very busy. But they bounce around and just terrorize different people or, yeah, I mean, so many... Who knows? Who knows what it could be? I feel like doppelgangers, there's the least amount of theories that I can kind of wrap my head around with them. I, I always think about like um, uh, like how there's so many different species uh, or so many different, like, yes, yeah, so many different species of different like animals on earth mm -hmm. that there could be some like paranormal or a parallel paranormal dimension. And there's a bunch of different creepy shit out there. Yeah. Or I guess it could be multiple dimensions. And like a doppelganger is just one of many terrible things out somewhere. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, wow, 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 wow. Oh, I wrote down last last night, the dogs. Last night. Oh, yeah. What was that about? Well, well also, can there be doggy doppelgangers? Doppel I can't <laughs> doggy, doggy doppelgangers? Yeah. I, I think what happened is we didn't pull the shades down and we were watching. Uh, actually, we started watching Severance. Which I, after I'm a, so like, a big late night talk. so confused. I know. We haven't finished the first episode and I like it, but it is fucking weird weird um, it's totally worth it i know you dan <laughs> yeah if you ha it's totally worth it. okay yes strap it i mean okay okay cool. yeah we're, we're we haven't quite finished the first episode we have like 15 minutes left yeah. and we said we'll definitely watch another episode and then take it from there yeah i, I like i like the tone i'm just like yeah. and i like it's an it's an unraveling mystery yeah but so we're all but it's you know it's weird it's just creepy it's not like it's not horror or anything uh -oh. but it's just like what and um sorry and we're sitting there and we had the blinds up and the dogs like you know they get I will say right off the right off the bat, Penny is like there are some shows she likes, some shows she's not interested in. She always loved Yellowstone. Yep, she's a weird dog who like will like like she's riveted. Like she watches certain shows. She literally will just go. Uh huh. Be so into it, and usually only freaks out if there's an animal on screen. Yeah, generally horses or no, cows. No, <laughs> yeah, no animals in this one. But she did not like what was going on on the screen for whatever reason. I know. For At first, she was like very close to the TV, as close as she could get. She yep. was doing like a down dog, just yep. watching it. Growling. She loved it. And then she got up and she got on the couch and she perched on pillows mm -hmm. so she could be close to us. And mm -hmm. then out of nowhere, the two of them- Just went berserk. Started growling. It wasn't. It was like low growls for a little bit and they're both looking out. We have like <laughs> the, these like, uh, like series of like four windows that like look out our back, into our backyard. Yeah. And they're each kind of looking out these like two sort of like the last two yeah. sort of towards the corner of the house. And so they're staring into like a dark corner of the yard. <laughs> yeah. I was so uncomfortable with that. It was, I don't, and then when I opened up the door, I mean, sometimes we'll do this if we work them up, but we didn't work them up where they do this. Like, it's like out of like a uh, Looney Tunes adventures. It's so cute. It's so cute where they, it's like their legs are peeling out. Like we're trying to open up the slider and they're barking and growling and like spinning and like on top of each other. Like, like one dog will jump on top of the other dog and then you open the door and they literally peel out like they're, they they're, they can't get traction on our on their floors and then one tramples the other as they run off just doing crazy barking into the night and something out there in the darkness had them all riled up um, but but nothing to be seen or found nope so I, I think it was a cat i think it was either a cat or their reflections yeah yeah there is like a cat like a neighborhood kitty cat hanging yeah. around i think i think that cat got ran out of the yard last night maybe maybe do you have a layla I have two. Ooh, double uh, duty. Yeah. I was I was working on stories here in the dark the other day and had my two little red Laylas and creepy music and it just, it was a good horror vibe. Okay. All so right. I kept them. All right. Well, let's get going with uh, some fan stories. Let's do it. Okay. Hi, Lindsay and Dan. I've always been a fan of the spooky. I'm a hardcore creeper. Yeah. Things just seem to happen around me. I have plenty of stories, some that even have been triggered back into memory by listening to the podcast. But I wanted to share this one because it's the longest running saga of paranormal in my life. It'll be long, but it's entirely worth it. <laughs> I found it in an antique shop where most good haunted item stories begin. The store was small and seemed to come out of nowhere. I'd driven this street many times before and never noticed it. But that day, I had a strong urge to stop. Inside, a hoarder's paradise. Thin aisles cluttered with old junk that could hardly be sorted through. I couldn't imagine how this store had any kind of turnaround. The small, older woman that worked there barely spoke English, but was very excited to have a customer. Anything I even glanced at, she would say, very good choice, or isn't it beautiful? Even with this lively woman, I didn't feel comfortable in the store. Still, I looked around enough to feel polite before heading out the door. I was just a few steps out when a voice in the back of my mind stopped me. No, you missed it. Go back. 
I frequently got these sort of feelings, and they usually direct me well, so I went back. Sure enough, there was a whole section I'd missed. Large frames and mirrors sat leaning against each other on the floor. I pulled them back from one another and heard that voice again. That one. It was a large, disassembled mirror, meaning the back, the mirror, and the frame were all in separate parts. It looked like a 1930s or 1940s dresser mirror, and it was gorgeous. The frame needed a new paint job, and it needed to be put back together, but it was literally calling to me. So I bought it. At the time, I didn't think anything of the fact that it was the only mirror in the store, not all in one piece. I took it as an opportunity to put paint on it more easily. I just barely fit it in the back seat of my car, and once I got home, life got in the way, and there it sat, disassembled in my living room for about a month. Nothing out of the ordinary or weird happened at the time. Once I finally got around to repainting it and putting it together, I leaned it against the wall to be hung up on, the mirror facing into our living room, and that's when it all began. My cats were the first ones to act strange. They'd been around mirrors their whole lives and it never bothered them. But my one cat kept pacing in front of the mirror and meowing at it. The other one would sit directly in front of it and stare at something seemingly beyond herself. Then that night, as my boyfriend and I watched TV, I couldn't help glancing at it out of the corner of my eye, like I was trying to catch something moving, but there was nothing there when I looked. My boyfriend also mentioned seeing something, so I got up and checked the room in the reflection. No strange feelings, cold spots, nothing. As every intelligent horror movie fan does, I got to my knees in front of the mirror and looked directly into it. (laughs) What looked back at me was not me. My reflection was pale, sunken, and gray. My hair was greasy and flat, almost wet-looking in clumps along the sides of my face. The circles around my eyes were so dark, they looked hollow. I had a split-second narcissistic horror that I actually looked like that. And then, then I made eye contact with myself. I wish I could describe what I saw, but for a lack of better words, it wasn't me. I was horrified. Instinctually, I screamed, Get out of my mirror! And then with more conviction and more strength, I repeated myself over and over, keeping eye contact until my eyes shifted back to normal. As soon as they did, a calm rushed over me. Whatever was in the mirror didn't seem to be there anymore. I looked back at my boyfriend, whose stunned face made my stomach drop. Uh, something just dropped out of the mirror and disappeared. And the next day, I went to a little store at the farmer's market to buy sage. As I brought it up to the counter, the little old woman asked me what I intended to use it for. Oh, I uh, I just want to get rid of some bad energy in my house. The woman grabbed my wrist suddenly and looked up at me with intense eyes that bore into my soul. The energy is still with you. Let me bless this. I was frightened, but emboldened by my blessed sage. I went home and I burned it all over the house. And I thought that was it. I'd felt it leave the mirror. My boyfriend had seen the energy purge itself. I'd been blessed by the sage goddess and it couldn't still possibly be there. I found soon... I hadn't purged it at all. I'd simply invited it into my home, and it was not happy. One day I came home and my window screens were bent, as if someone had been trying to break in, and the door handle was broken. I called the cops to report it, and then my landlord to replace it. Both the cops and my landlord separately said the same things. The door handle is broken from the inside, and the window was pushed out of their frame, not pulled. I had to fight with my landlord for a free replacement since he was convinced that I had broken it. More than that, I would come home to the blinds being pulled out of their sockets in ways I could barely do, let alone my cats. Twice, I came home, and the stove burner was on. No fire, but it was filling the apartment with gas, and I hadn't used the stove in days. It got to the point where I, that I started covering the knobs with tinfoil before I would leave the apartment. The reflection itself seemed to be off in some way. The cats would sit in front of the mirror, meowing, pawing, or sometimes just staring, as if they were hunting something. Of course I wanted to get rid of it, but what was I supposed to do? I didn't want to donate it for some other schmuck to wind up it with it the way I did. I couldn't just throw it away for fear someone would take it. That's the way we all found our furniture in college. Hmm. I ended up giving it to a friend of a friend. I gave her fair warning, but she wanted it for her office. Ugh. The day I went to give it away, I stood in my living room and explained, Listen. I know you don't like it here, so I found you a new home. Someone who wants you. Now please, go back into the mirror so I can take you to her. I felt the energy shift in the room as if a darkness had lifted. I quickly threw a towel over the mirror, packed it into my car, and dropped it off at the new owner's office. 
Thankfully, that was the end of my experience, but it was just the beginning for the office. I received a few updates about the mirror before its disappearance. At first, the new owner had put the mirror in the main office, but people felt an indescribably uncomfortable feeling around it. It darkened their day, their moods, and people seemed less than thrilled to be working together. Enough complained about it that the mirror itself was causing the problem and the company's boss, a non-believer in superstition, decided to put it in his office. He would often bring his dog to work. The dog would happily sit in his office, sleeping the day away in its cozy bed. But the second the mirror was hung, the dog refused to go in. He whined and barked so loudly the boss had to take him home. And after that, the dog simply wouldn't go to his office ever. After some t- over some time, the boss started to feel the same dark effects as myself and his employees. Lethargy, sudden bursts of anger, difficulty getting things done. He chalked it up to being overworked. But the final clincher that made this man a believer was one day he'd left for a meeting and locked his office. Only he and the nightmates had a key to his office. When he returned, his office was trashed. Neatly stacked papers exploded everywhere. Trash scattered, coffee spilled, everything you could think of. It would be a cruel prank for anyone to pull off. He knew he'd lock the door. He knew no one could get in. And then he knew finally, without a shadow of a doubt, that whatever was in the mirror had caused it. The last I heard, the mirror that I found was on its way to DC Studios in Los Angeles. I've lost Mm -hmm. track of it since, but I know that it's still out there tormenting whoever finds it in the least bit alluring. Best, Ellie. Ellie. Uh, I was thinking like, um, you know, what to do with a mirror like that. And the the individual, the vision I had in my head is like, take it, like put it in like a body bag type thing. Yeah. Yeah. With this, with a bunch of rocks in it. Yeah. Take it out in the boat, like a deep lake yeah. and just push it into the water where it's like going to sink to the bottom and be sealed up. So it can't be seen like, just like put it where in all likelihood, no one will ever find it. But bro, the energy is still in it. Like now it's what is going to haunt the lake. But maybe if it's deep enough, it, that energy won't reach any place. I don't think that's how energy works, my love. Because like we've like had haunted lakes. What is that? Lake Powell? No, no. What is it? We I know. Have, it's been a while. Like something in Georgia, there was like this really uh, like good haunted really lake Really haunted lake. Um, and, then, and then another thought I had was when she uh, takes that to the, when it ends up at the office before it goes off to DC Studios. Yeah. I think about like how we get mail here, which by the way, we, we, we almost never talk about it. Which is crazy to me that we almost never talk about it, but we still get mail. I know it is so fun. We're yeah, we never expect it, and just like always, so grateful. It's it's crazy how much we get, and so thankful. But then I was thinking, like you know, uh, oftentimes Tyler is like, well, Tyler, I think usually gets the mail now. Yeah, once a week, once every two weeks, something like that. And what if all of a sudden he brings it back? Like we like we can pinpoint the day. Uh-huh. It's like a mail day, uh-huh. and from that day forward, the energy has just shifted. Yeah, and then like trying to figure out what came into the studio that changed things. And then we just take all the fan gifts and put them in a pile and burn it? <laughs> or the one, that, yeah, from that week's delivery or something. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I uh, The fact that this mirror is still out there somewhere mm-hmm. is really upsetting. Um, yeah, I don't know what you do to get rid of energy in a mirror. Because I... What if if you shatter it? I don't know if that releases it or something. Releases it, but then does it just like jump into something else? I don't know that this this episode is like my worst nightmares. Like between the doppelganger and the mirror. Uh huh. That w- in the beginning of Ellie's story, when she just talked about looking in, and seeing a reflection, change pale, uh, clumps of hair and stuff. That is literally one of my worst nightmares. That is what I have to actively work so hard to think about no, if right. I'm on psychedelics. Because you look different anyway, and I have to like, don't look in the mirror. Don't. That, that's one I, of my main thoughts when I'm on mirrors, like around mirrors. Is that don't look in the mirror. Don't look in the mirror. Don't look in the mirror. It is so hard not to take notes and just mess with you. You are I'm, so I, lucky that I don't have like the time and energy to figure out how to get like open up a wall, get behind the mirror, put in a projector so that when you look in the mirror, you see something. Like this would be the most enjoyable thing for me to do because- I might literally die of a heart attack. <laughs> you would for sure pee your pants and that would be pretty yeah. fun for me. And I'd be shrieking. I'd be, I'd be making sounds that I've maybe never made before. <laughs> Just pure, pure terror. I, I know I've talked about this before, but it's been a while. But that always makes me think that prank about this. It was like this Japanese like game show oh, or something. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the series. The, the guy where the, 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 guy, like, the, the, the yes. TV- uh, no, not the oh. one on the TV, but he was in a dressing room and he was looking in the mirror and they had something set up where this thing shows up in the mirror. I don't know how they did it to like you could, s- the mirror would reflect, but also you could see something behind it. And and it was like dressed like uh, this uh, 
woman dress up like from the ring, like that kind of like dark black hair covering most of her face, yeah, very yeah. pale nightgown. And then she burst through the wall and like was chasing him. I think, are you maybe mashing two things up or are these like two different things? Because I was thinking of the ring thing also, but it's like a boyfriend that pulls this oh, drink on her girlfriend. That's a different video. Okay. Well, That one's really good too because like, she's asleep. But this one, the guy's wide awake in this room. Gotcha. And it looks so real and this thing bursts and then the actress chases him around the room and he, like this grown man, it looks like he's going to literally die of fright. What do you think it would sound like? What would the scream sound like? I don't even want to do it because I'd have to be so loud in here. <laughs> and, and it would probably hurt my throat because it'd be like a, a high-pitched... Like, ah! Yeah. Like, like, like what? Just, ah! Ah! Just like craziness. But like more than that. <laughs> I'm not helpful. Now I'm wondering like what our neighbors in the building are like, what? Did someone just get murdered downstairs? <laughs> That's what I was immediately thinking. I was like, God, I hope no one's, everybody's out to lunch right now. Yep. I think right Someone's above us. Someone's going to be knocking on our door and be like, what the hell just happened down there? No, nothing. I think Trav is above us. So all I can, our friend Traver is mm -hmm. in this building and he uh, does like estate planning. And I just imagine <laughs> him up there with like an older couple. And they're just like, what just happened? Oh uh, don't worry about it. There's just a podcast on series. It's fine. They're like, what's a podcast? <laughs> right. He's like, forget it. Talk radio? We want to hear it? Oh my <laughs> God. Great story. Yeah. Great story. Great story, Ellie. Yeah. yeah. And I'm assuming that how the mirror, because like when I said the thing that it was on its way to DC Studios, you had a, a reaction. I'm sure that it just like, when you work in production and you're a set designer, um, you know, you are looking for items all over the world to build out a set. What are yeah. you looking at? Oh, it was just a little gnat. Oh, um, so sometimes you're just like, I bet this mirror was put up for sale on like eBay or Craigslist or some sort of like online situation. Yeah. And so that's probably how it ended up there. It's like some set designer was like, okay, or set, or, or set decorator was like, the, hey. The mirror called to them. Well, yeah. Or they were just like working on something like, oh, that's great. Yeah. They're about to find out not so great. Mm. And speaking of, I don't think that we've really had any like haunted set studio stories oh yeah we haven't yeah i'm gonna task you with because i will tell you like after working on like every lot in la some of them are creepy as shit Ugh. like like just like late at night you have oh, to like man you have to like no, go thanks. into a a sound deadened uh stage <sighs> yeah a sound stage like yeah. so it's already messing with your brain because of the sound deadening yeah, it's so weird mm -hmm. okay do you have time for one more yeah i do okay great 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 this story is really like I love this. Dear queen and king of the suck and the scary shit. <laughs> I come to you with a haunting hunting story. I grew up in the backcountry of your neighboring state of Wyoming, south of Yellowstone mm. National Park. My dad and I would take mountain pack trips on horses back into bumfuck nowhere every fall to hunt for elk, deer, and bear. One of our favorite hunting spots is a 15 mile ride into a valley named War Horse, which used to be named whorehouse but map makers decided that it wasn't so nice so they changed it the reason for the name whorehouse is because of a mid 19th century brothel that operated during the time period for miners in the surrounding valleys the structure still stands and one can stay the night in it if they wish about 10 years ago my father and i decide, decided to spend the night there as we rode up to the building with the pack string the horses got uneasy as if they sensed a predator or some other threat we kept pushing on, however, the horses didn't calm down until we tied them up for the night in a stand of trees near the structure. Even then, they were still a little bit on edge, but we couldn't find any signs of any predators. We were giddy with curiosity when we entered the brothel on the first floor and started to explore. The building is two stories with the staircase at the south end and a balcony off the second floor that looks to the east. The brothel is maybe 1,500 square feet and has the look of a typical old Wild West townhouse. We set up camp for the night on the first floor and ate dinner with no issue. We used the satellite phone to let my mom know we were safe and sound and not to worry about her boys. Leaving our packs, saddles, cookware, and camping stuff downstairs, we moved some old pails of nails, horseshoes, and wire mm -hmm. to the foot of the front door so that no one could come in in the night while we were asleep. With three pails, each weighing about 60 pounds each, up against the door, we felt secure. And then we took our sleeping bags and our rifles to the balcony to sleep under the stars, where we could sleep and watch the horses. It was probably midnight when we finally fell asleep. At about 3 a.m., we were both awoken to the shorting and pawing of the horses. Shining our headlamps off the balcony, we saw no other eyes besides those of our stock. What do you think that has them all riled up like that? I asked my dad. I have no clue. I see nothing out there. And then we heard it for the first time. 
the distinct footfalls from the first floor of the brothel. It sounded as if someone had on high heels and was walking around in circles downstairs. Then a scraping noise came, the sound of someone dragging something heavy across the wood floor. My father reached for his hunting rifle that was previously propped up against the balcony railing, but it wasn't there, and neither was mine. Uh. I've never seen my father so afraid, so pale. Having been a law enforcement officer, he'd seen some pretty gruesome, scary shit, but the fear took over his face. Of course, that made 16-year-old me crawl with goosebumps. Only after two minutes, which seemed like an eternity, the sound stopped and we went to investigate. My father tried to open the door from the balcony that led into the brothel, but he couldn't budge it, even when pressing his full body weight into the door. It must be blocked somehow, he said, trying to catch his breath. Can you climb down the balcony post and open it from the inside? My first thought was, I don't want to go down into the damn place. But when your father asks you to man up, you do it. I half climbed, half fell down the corner post of the balcony, making it to the ground with a thump. Looking at the old wooden front door, I knew the heavy pails were behind it, so I stepped back to get a running start, and then I dropped my shoulder into the door. And as I made contact, the door propped open with ease, and I tumbled onto the wooden floor. Frantically, I shined my headlamp around the room as I got to my feet. In my mind, I was so confused as to why the door had opened so easily, but all my thoughts halted when my sight landed on my rifle. (laughs) There, both rifles sat, in the old cobblestone fireplace, and the ammunition was strewn across the hearth of the fireplace. My father called down, Are you all right down there? I replied the best I could, with my stomach in my throat, frozen with terror and confusion. Uh, not really. Let me in so I can scope the place out. It took me a minute to take my eyes off the misplaced rifles and rounds, but I finally moved to the second floor where I saw the three pails that had been previously propped up to keep us safe against the door that led to the balcony. With my heart pounding, I looked around for any signs of life in the room, but there was nothing. I quickly moved the pails out of the way, and my father's headlamp shone in my face when the door opened. The first words out of his mouth were, Well, what did you see? All I could do was point to the stairs and say, See for yourself. I can't explain it. I followed him down the stairs and his reaction was the same as mine when he saw the misplaced rifles. After a few moments, he said in a tone that I'd never heard come from him before, we're leaving now. We've we've never saddled up and packed the string as fast as we did that night. It wasn't until we were a quarter mile from the brothel that the horses finally calmed down. They sure did not like whatever Mm -hmm. was in that building. We didn't stop moving until about an hour later when we checked our rifles for any signs of harm. On each stainless steel barrel was one small black handprint, as if a small woman had grabbed it with soot on her hands. Both my father's and my hands were much larger than the print, and we always cleaned our rifles liberally. The action of each gun was also covered in soot, where we found no ammunition in the three round magazines of the rifles. We always had the magazines full while hunting. Chills ran down our spines as we pieced together the realization that something had moved, unloaded, and replaced our rifles, and that something had also moved 180 pounds of old rusted iron from the front door of the brothel upstairs to the balcony, essentially locking us in. Ever since, we've avoided going into that valley and seldom talk about the experience. Of course, my mom and my brother don't believe us, but we sure as hell aren't going back to that haunted whorehouse ever again. Yee. Tate. Now, Tate, uh... Tate was there with father and father-in-law. No. Oh, I thought I heard. I thought I heard you say father-in-law once. Just Literally father. never once. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So that I just just wanted to be sure. So dad was the um, law enforcement, mm-hmm. and when he said like you know, despite his dad being in law enforcement, you yeah, know, he, he was still freaked out. It's like yeah, I bet he was especially freaked out because he had been in law enforcement. Exactly. When you see that you know like your rifles are missing, my mind wouldn't go to the paranormal. No, not at all. It would go to like holy shit, some psychopath. That's right. We're way out here where no one else is around, and mm-hmm. now they have our rifles. Uh-huh. That would be terrifying. Terrifying just on a human level. Forget, yeah, like, like oh, you said, yeah. forget about paranormal. Then you're hiding by the doorway, c- trying to come up quietly with a plan of like, man, when they come in this room, we have to grab them, wrestle them to the ground, hope there's not more than one. Yeah. So many things. So many things. I guess your only other option is to try and, <sighs> you know, very carefully shimmy down the balcony. The balcony, it took me a minute to realize that like the balcony was outside. Yeah. You know, I know that he said sleep under the stars, but it, like it, I was yeah. thinking like a bedroom with a balcony. So like they had 
Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. But at least they saw their horses. So in yes, my mind, yes. I was like, okay, worst case scenario, you somehow have to very quietly and gingerly shimmy down and get on your horse and GTFO. I, I was thinking what I would do in that situation. I love that. I'm immediately like, run away from it. Just get away, get away. Just with the nature of hunting rifles, if somebody is familiar with them at all, I don't know if they're, I, I don't know if you mentioned scope. I don't, I don't think I heard a scope, but if they're scoped at all or anything, even if they're not with like a good hunting rifle, it's like, they could easily shoot you as you ran off on a horse, like from a pretty decent distance. I know. So I'm like, no, you got to, if there's one entrance to that upstairs room, you got to stand on both, like hide by that entrance and just be ready to bum rush whoever like comes into that room and wait for daylight and wait for them to hopefully just go away. But I guess- Let them steal your rifles. I guess the good thing is, is that you were locked in that room now from mm -hmm, the outside. Mm -hmm. So if someone was going to come in, you would have to, you would hear them. Totally, totally. They couldn't get you by surprise. Exactly. So you could also just wait it out. And then the soot later, that was a cool detail uh -huh. of like some small set of hands. Yeah. Touching the ammunition, touching the rifle. Well, you know, you know what dawned on me later after I read the story was that like when they hear the footfall, he says that they hear the footfall of the, of like uh, high heels. And he says, it sounds like they're going in circles. I'm like, oh, they're dancing. They're hearing the, the uh, you know, is a brothel. Men would come there. The women, they would be dancing with the men or just like, you know, showing. I wonder if it was common for the women too. I mean, this is just based on me watching a lot of Westerns. Uh-huh. You know, they when the, when dudes would go into gambling halls, saloons, uh -huh. brothels, I think it was pretty common where it's like they would take their weapons, yeah. set them in a, you know, place for that. Mm -hmm. So when, you know, things didn't get out of hand, they didn't have an easy weapon to access. Exactly. So maybe the women were just like used to like, we're going to take your rifles. We're going to set them over here by the hearth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, maybe the leftover spirit that was there, she was annoyed. They hadn't like followed protocol. Mm -hmm. Got to take the bullets out. I did think I loved the detail of like, and it was so smart when they got there to set up camp for the night that they took these old heavy pails to put in front of the, mm. because there could mm -hmm. be other camper no, or that other too. hunters. I was like, oh, that's yeah. very logical. And then how that spirit took those three pails and got them upstairs and put them in front of the cool door the, to lock them in. Cool that the building was still there. It, it was still there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, lo I loved both these stories. This yeah, week. I liked all the stories. This is a great episode. <laughs> this is an exceptionally good one. <laughs> uh, do you want to thank some of our Annabelles? Nah. No. Okay. I'll, uh, let me start then, and then we'll see. If, and we'll see if you want to in a few minutes, in a few, like a minute. Okay. Let's see if I feel up to it. Okay. Uh, I want to thank the following Annabelle so much for supporting the show and supporting the charities we donate to. Blue Wolf Fifty Nine. Nice. Uh, Rustin Dirks. Ha! I love this one. Sam Elliott's mustache. Maybe the bus best mustache of all time. Possibly. Sam Elliott, like. Mm, I'm trying to think like Roadhouse era. Like, yes, he was great in that 1883 or whatever, like a yeah, yeah. Yellowstone companion piece. But Sam Elliott, like 20, 25 years ago. Yeah. Maybe the greatest mustache Hollywood's ever seen. I agree. Right up there with Tom Selleck. Ooh. Michael Tuls Tulson, Tulson, and then just Jay. Darren Gerling, Rob Sparkman, Megan Haley, Tyler Valentine, and Eddie Wheeler. And I would... I would like you to You're know ready? that I feel like energized enough now okay, good. to thank the following Annabelles. Mason Pemberton, Drew Basford, Courtney Cattell, Zachary Honey. What a name. <laughs> Kendra Hunter, Kelly Ferretti. DJ Honey. Where's DJ Honey been? I don't know, but he's- uh, Has he been on vacation Zachary. Oh, okay. This is my nephew, Zachary, filling in today in the studio for Charlotte's number one adult contemporary station. Okay, sorry. Okay, the notes. Great. We love it. Ruthie Lechner. <laughs> uh, Kite is grit. Kate is. I, I feel like there's a typo here, not from me, but just like on the. Because mm -hmm. I don't get it. K e i g h t. K K e i g h t. Kite. Kate. Kit. Yeah, Kate or Kite. Kit, kit is grit. I, I'm not sure. I'm happy to accept an email and do a correction. Cody. <laughs> Cody four twenty. Matt. I think, I think it's pronounced Kodai. C o d y. Yes, that's Kodai. Get out of Dodge. What nah, is wrong with you? Oh, speak, <laughs> speaking of name pronunciations, mispronunciations, I'm going to talk to you about your first story. I think you have a, a bogey there. Oh. Uh, Matt Bogart and Zachary Rogers. Okay. And then I have the following spoopy shout outs. To Kelsey from your sister-in-law, Angelique. Happy Dirty 30. Oh man, your 30s are fucking awesome. Mm -hmm. Enjoy them. Uh, I'm about to leave my 30s and I have loved every minute. <laughs> Kind of. Marin, uh, to Marin from your mom, Micah, happy 15th birthday to my fidget. Love you to the moon and stars around the sun and back again. To Daniela from Fernando, thank you for everything you do. I love you. Uh, to Ramel from Carol, happy belated birthday. 
and happy anniversary, sweets. This is the week of our anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. It's the seven year itch. I mean, (laughs) okay. And your first story. Yeah, what did I do? uh, Lucian? Yeah, Lucian. Did you? L L U C I E N. Lucian? Lucian. Um, I mean, this person, I couldn't find like a YouTube. I, sh- I guess I could have looked up somebody else with that same spelling. I'm just, I, I mean, it could go either I was, way. I was thinking of like Lucifer, but it's probably Lucian. Oh, I'm not familiar with it. Okay, cool. Possibly. Yeah. But I did write it down immediately. I was like, does he mean Lucian? Yeah, so maybe. if anybody else was wondering, there you, <laughs> there you have there it. There you have it. And that is our show. Thanks for continuing to send your personal tales of terror to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. You can email us for everything else, info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thank you to Logan Keith for producing and directing today. And uh, Were you uncertain about that? No, no, no. I Sometimes I switch the wording around in my head just not oh. to be like repetitive. Oh, yeah. I and was like, oh, did you think it was Tyler out there? Nope, I didn't. Uh, thanks to book editor Drew Atana for polishing, preparing listener stories for, I guess, now is it book number five? Number five. Th- these stories are still in four. We're not quite yeah. to the end of book four. Uh, episode 208 is the last set of stories that will be in your volume four book. Thanks to Olivia Lee for finding the first story I told this week. I was able to find the second. Subscribe to Bad Magic Productions on YouTube if you want to watch the show. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram if you want more content and pics that accompany episodes at Scared to Death Podcast and TikTok at Scared to Death Podcast as well. well. And if you don't want to hear ads and want monthly bonus episodes and more, check out our Patreon and get the entire catalog ad free. And don't forget to get your creepy ass keychains and magnets. Mm-hmm. I also recommend them for just like a good practical joke. <laughs> yes. Uh, enjoy your nightmares, creeps and peepers. Hope you were scared to death. You're number one. You're number one. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but have no home here within scare to death. Bad Magic Productions.